This is an introduction to William Matthews's poem, Cheap Seats, The Cincinnati Gardens Professional Basketball, 1959, by Michael Elliott at the University of Calgary. William Matthews was an American poet born in 1942. So just for context, the year in which the events happen in this sonnet, 1959, Matthews would have been 17 years old. He recounts the experience of watching professional basketball games at the Cincinnati Gardens, as the title suggests, by a losing team, namely the Cincinnati Royals, who would ultimately become the Sacramento Kings. The Royals, it has to be said, had an absolutely abysmal win-loss record. 1958-59, the record was 19-53, to In 59 to 60, it was 19 to 56. They were dead last in the NBA, the National Basketball Association. And that's important for line seven of this poem, which says two nights out of three, like us, they'd lose. The speaker of this poem, who may or may not be Williams himself, recounts how he would watch these games in the Cincinnati Gardens a performance venue that was built in 1949 and not demolished until 2018. Here is the complete poem, starting at line one. The less we paid, the more we climbed. Tendrils of smoke lazed just as high and hung there, blue, particulate, the opposite of dew. We saw the whole court from up there, Few girls had come, few wives, numerous boys in molt like me. Our heroes leapt and surged and looped, and two nights out of three, like us, they'd lose. But like us is wrong. We had no result three nights out of three. So we had heroes. And we is wrong. For I knew none by name among that hazy company, unless I brought her with me. This was loneliness with noise, unlike the kind I had at home, with no clock running down and mirrors. The tone of this poem, obviously, is pretty somber. The speaker describes loneliness with noise in lines 12 to 13. And that suggests that he and his fellow spectators gathered together so that they could console themselves or distract themselves. The noise abates the loneliness. The clock that runs down in line 14 at least suggests to them that there may be suffering and there may be loss, but it will ultimately come to some periodic conclusion or pause. And there's a feeling of relief that comes from this displacement of watching others strive and others lose, namely the players. And a camaraderie among those spectators. Even if, as Williams does, he questions how well they really knew each other, not even exchanging names, for example. I feel like it's fair to say that a tone of loss is also all the way through this poem, not just of losing games and of losing romantic overtures, but also loss of the nameless her in line 12, whom the speaker has presumably lost, hence the loneliness, or with whom he is miserable. He has no clock to denote an end to their misery. What the speaker appreciates about the games, as I said, is the clock, that sense that something will come to an end or there will be a sense of purpose And what he dislikes about his solitary home life are the mirrors. He dislikes them because they require him to look himself in the eye, to confront 
something unnamed, something about himself, maybe his own unattractiveness, maybe his just his state of solitude. It's not clear. It's not explicit. And that's kind of the, the beauty or the weight, I suppose, the sad beauty of that last line, that last word, rather, the word mirrors. The reason I'm calling attention to a single word, and not for the last time in this introduction, is because certain literary critical arguments depend very heavily on the quotation of exact words, the exact words that a poet has used to express an idea. Whereas other arguments of literary critics depend just on paraphrasing or talking about ideas that the poet has introduced or discussed without citing the exact words that they have chosen to express them. Mirrors is a word that just hangs out there at the end of this poem. And its placement means that it bears a lot of weight, a lot of meaning associated with other words and other moments in this poem when the poet is emphasizing sight or the act of seeing or looking at things. Not only does he tell us in line four that we saw the whole court from up there, where they are watching their heroes from on high, looking as a spectator at the heroes, as at the models of potential victory in more romantic, more personal realms, looking as a spectator prevents self-scrutiny, the kind that you have to engage in if you look at yourself in a mirror. And looking happens, in this case, through the layers of smoke that have accumulated from the smoking spectators below, hanging in the air, hanging among the rafters, like tendrils. Tendrils is a word that is usually associated with the plant kingdom. It refers to the, the branches or appendages of the plant that uh, stretch themselves out from the main body. The more common metaphor for tendrils is tendrils of hair, for example. But here they have a more menacing quality. They are what he calls particulate, a descriptor for airborne molecules or particles that are usually contaminants, or in this case, cancerous. The other interesting descriptor for the smoke is that it lazed. That means it, in line two, that means it smoke, the smoke rose and it lingered there among the, the boys in molt, as he describes them in line five. Molting is an interesting word choice. It's a process that we usually associate with animals when they're shedding skin or feathers or fur to make way for new growth. And so it suggests that these are adolescents or men in early adulthood, hence the, the descriptor boys with very few wives or accompanying girls, as he calls them. The reason that I am focusing in this analysis on Matthew's specific words is because Matthew himself does this. In line eight, for example, he questions the words like us as a phrase. In line 10, he questions the word we. Both like us and we are words or phrases he has used in the lines above. So when would you quote this poem and when would you paraphrase its words if you were writing an, al an analysis of it? The answer, unfortunately, depends on the degree to which your analysis relies on individual word choices. So, for example, let's say you wanted to make an argument that the smoke is a symbol of, of this enervating or draining kind of feeling of malaise or, or discontent or rootlessness or something in the adolescent's habits of self-distraction that encourages them to look outward toward the heroes on the court and 
outward from themselves as they would see in mirrors and outward from even the fellowship, the, the, the fellow feeling or, or companionship that they might get from knowing so much as each other's names. If I were to make that argument, it would very much rely, I think, on the, the two words that I've circled in my copy. In line two, it's the lazed, smoke lazed just as high. And in line 11, that hazy company. There is something lazy about this rising smoke, just as there is something hazy about their refusal or disinclination to meet each other's eyes or to introduce themselves to each other. And I could say more about that if I wanted to, but that the point is that that's the kind of argument that requires quotation. The kind of argument that doesn't require quotation, however, might be, say, something about the similarities between the heroes and the spectators. The heroes are heroes, the word that he uses twice, by the way, in line six and in line nine. They are heroes because they are moderately more successful than the spectators. But in order to make that argument, I don't need to specify precisely that the players win one in three times and the spectators don't. Two out of three and three out of three are statistics that are overly specific for this kind of argument. Although they might well be useful to another kind of argument. So, to conclude, use quotations when a poet's diction matters to your argument, but if the broad ideas are what are important, then merely use paraphrase.